as was mentioned, Machinery of Freedom was published about uh, 40 years ago. And I'm thinking of doing a third edition and have various ideas that I want to add or modify in that. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about uh, some of those. And it did occur to me that since my publisher unfortunately neglected to arrange for a Czech translation, it was possible that there would be one or two people in the room who had not read the book. Uh, and I therefore thought I should start with a very brief sketch of the central argument of part three, which is <clears throat> what my comments really have to do with. And in that part, I was exploring the possibility of carrying the free market position all the way to its limit, of saying, what if we not only privatize uh, agriculture and housing and schools, but if you also privatize courts and lawmaking and simply replace the entire apparatus of government with a free market set of subsidies. Those parts you want to replace. Many parts of the apparatus you would prefer to leave unreplaced. But, but much of it, clearly it is, people do require some way of having their rights protected, of settling disputes, and so forth. And I sketched out a hypothetical set of institutions. Uh, since then, I've learned much more about historical institutions, and parts of my hypothetical do correspond to things that have existed, parts don't. Uh, but the way those institutions work was as follows. Uh, every individual is the customer of a firm that sells the service of protecting his rights and settling his disputes. Every pair of such firms has an agreement specifying the private court that will settle disputes between them. So the basic idea, whenever you suggest a private market system for, for rights enforcement, the immediate response is what happens when I and my rights enforcement agency think that this gentleman has stolen something from me and threatened to use force to make him give it back, and he replies that he hasn't, and his agency will defend him. To him. And then people say there will be a war between the two agencies. And my response is that these agencies are profit-making firms, that war is very expensive, you have to pay your employees hazard pay if they are going to have to fight each other. Furthermore, your customers would much rather have a system in which their rights are protected rather than in which at random either their rights are violated when the other side wins or they get to violate someone else's rights when, when they win. So the argument would be that you can provide a higher quality service at a lower cost if you agree with each other agency. If we have a dispute, this private court we have chosen in advance will settle it. Uh, in that system, uh, where does the law come from? And the answer is the law is being produced on the free market by the private courts that each private court wishes to have legal rules such that rights enforcement agencies will choose to use it. Uh, the rights enforcement agencies are middlemen selling the legal service to their customers. They therefore want to choose the legal system that their customers most want to be under. Uh, and thus you are getting a market produced system of law. And that was the basic logic. And I want to talk about three or four different things that I would add to or expand from that, uh, which makes this a somewhat less organized talk than most talks that I, that I try to do. And I want to start with the one good review that book ever got. Now, my definition of a good review is not a friendly review. There have been a number of those. It is a review that makes the author think. And the one such review I got was by James Buchanan, who was at one time a colleague of and he said various friendly things about the book, but he then pointed out that there was one very serious hole in my argument. And to see the hole, you have to let me sketch the part of my argument which was designed to show that the legal rules produced by my institutions would be what we think of as economically efficient rules, rules that maximize the sum benefit to all people who are affected. All right, that's what economic efficiency really comes down to in the sort of very short version sometimes referred to as maximizing the size of the pie. And so I imagined a case where you have two agencies, and the customers of one of the agencies are in favor of capital punishment for murder, and the customers of the other agency are against it. So my agency observes that its customers think capital punishment is a fine idea and believe it deters murder, and they think that if only their agency can get a court that uh, believes in capital punishment, they will be less likely to his agency, on the other hand, 
uh, believes that capital punishment does not deter murder, feels guilty about the possibility of causing somebody to be executed who perhaps is innocent, and perhaps are a little worried that if they ever kill somebody, they might get executed. So his agency would prefer a legal rule that does not include capital punishment. My agency would prefer weapon arrest. So what happens? Uh, my agency does a little market research. They try to figure out how much their customers like capital punishment. That is, how much they're willing to pay for it. And they conclude that if they could only guarantee capital punishment in disputes with his agency, they could collect an extra million dollars a year by charging higher prices for providing a better quality product to their customers. His agency engages in similar research. And let us suppose it concludes that it could make an additional $2 million a year, that that's the sum value to its customers of getting a court that does not have capital punishment. So then the two agencies bargain. It is clear that having a court that does not have capital punishment produces a net benefit. So uh, we have a non-capital agency court, and his agency pays my agency a million and a half dollars to buy its agreement. And I argued that processes like that would yield economically efficient legal rules, that any time a change in the legal rule benefited the people who liked it more than it cost the people who didn't like it, there would be market pressure to make that change. With some and Buchanan's reply was yes, but you haven't answered one very important question. In order to get the agency without capital punishment, does his agency have to pay mine, or does it merely have to reject my agency's attempts to pay it? What, in other words, is the default rule? What, are we, what starting point are we bargaining from? So for any economist in the audience, I was making a point about allocation. Jim was raising a point about distribution. Do people who don't want capital punishment have to uh, pay to get their rules, or is it that the other side would have to pay them to get theirs? And that was a question I had not thought about, and it turned out to be an interesting, and I will argue in some ways important question. Uh, thinking about it, it occurred to me that this is not an issue limited to my imaginary society. That after all, every society has a set of legal rules. People prefer one or another. And you might think of every society being a sort of a peaceful arrangement built on top of a threat game. That underlying the society is the idea that if people are sufficiently unhappy, they take out guns and start shooting each other. Uh, we have a sort of a very low-key version of that in America in the Occupy movement which is basically saying we don't like the rules and we're willing to break the rules in order to get it. We have a much uh, higher key and more unpleasant version going on in Syria at the moment. But you might think that in any society, the distribution game partly depends on to what degree each person in the society believes that if they don't give in a bit on what they want, uh, there may not be a peaceful, pleasant society for them to live in. Right? So you can imagine in my society that as things are beginning, most of what my rights enforcement agencies are doing is arresting criminals and settling disputes, but in the basement there are some tanks because they know that at some point in dealing with another agency, his agency says we don't like capital punishment. If you pay us enough, we'll agree to capital punishment. And my agency is saying, we do like capital punishment. If you pay us enough, we'll agree to not have, and we have to somehow settle that. And at that point, where you settle it is partly a question of how believable the threats by each side are, that if the bargaining does break down, they would be able to, uh, to use force. And I think that's, that's the basic, the initial answer to, to Jim's question. Uh, but we know a little bit about such games, because the world is full of them. Uh, mutual threat games among nations, Mutual threat games, with not with guns, but with less violent things between labor unions and employers, uh, many other contexts among different factions within a political system. And one of the things you observe, if you look at least at the international case, is that there is a great deal of inertia in that system. That even though in some sense your national border is where it is, because at some time in the past somebody won or lost a battle, nobody expects that if a country launches one more battleship, its borders will move half a mile out. 
or if a country cuts its military budget, its borders move half a mile. So because everybody knows that violence is a very expensive and risky thing, once an initial distribution is somehow in some way gotten, gotten determined, it is likely that the status quo, as it will, will, will maintain itself. Right? Now, when I thought about it, I realized that this question of the distribution rather than the allocation is actually important for a different part of my argument. Because one of the questions I discussed in Machinery of Freedom was whether my system of institutions would be stable. And the biggest danger I could see to stability was the possibility of cartel formation. That imagine that there are only two or three rights enforcement agencies in, let us say, what is what used to be America. It is possible that it will occur to them that robbery is more profitable than business. And if they get together and recreate the government, with them as the government, they then don't have to worry about competing, they don't have to worry about producing a good value for their customers, they can do what governments routinely do, which is to say to the customers, this is the price you are paying, if you don't pay it, we will lock you up. All right? Uh, so that would be a worry. And it seemed to me that the real question here was how many agencies there were. And for the economists, that's a question about economies of scale that we observe in any industry that when you have a very, very small firm, you can probably produce better products more cheaply by getting bigger. But when you get to some size, getting still bigger gets you nothing and means there are more and more layers of bureaucracy between the president of the company and the factory floor, and now you work worse and worse, less and less well. So that you observe in any industry, in some industries, in farming, you end up with many, many thousands of separate firms. Uh, in automobiles, in one country perhaps four or five. Uh, it's very uncommon, though not unknown, you will end up with only one. So if the economies of scale in the business of my rights enforcement agencies are such that we end up with hundreds of them, we're probably safe. If one agency decides to say to its customers, you no longer have the right to leave, the customers will call up its competitors uh, and get rescued by them. But if the economies of scale are such that we have only two or three or four, firms, now there is a real risk that they will get together, create a cartel in effect in the rights enforcement agency, raise their prices, and not let customers leave. Right? When I wrote Machinery of Freedom, I was thinking of economies of scale in terms of the enforcement of rights, of the ordinary day-to-day -day business of investigating complaints about crimes, of arranging for arbitration of uh, civil disputes, and so forth. And it seemed to me that looking at the equivalent in governments, there did not seem to be very large economies of scale. We don't observe that big, big cities provide better police protection cheaper than small towns. Uh, we don't observe that big countries somehow work better than small countries. So it seemed to be quite likely, though I didn't know, this, this is all an imaginary system I'm trying to think my way through as best I can. I thought it was likely that you would end up with many rights enforcement agencies and thus would not be at very much risk of, of recreating them. Uh, when I thought about Jim's problem, I realized that that was a difficulty for me. Because even if there are no economies of scale in enforcing rights, there might still be economies of scale in bullying other agencies and threatening other agencies. And we do observe, not at all times in history, but at some times in history, that big countries beat small countries. All right? The, in the previous incarnation of this country had a problem with that about uh, 70 years ago, as you all know from your history. <laughs> Uh, and so therefore, it seemed to me that that somewhat weakened my original argument. And it suggested that when you were originally getting the kind of society I was imagining going, there would be a serious risk that the advantages of big firms would be enough so you would have only a few, whereas once it was going, that would disappear because once everybody knows what the default rules are, now any agency that tries to push the rules without paying for it will be seen as dangerous as sort of breaking the rules of the game. Others will ally against it. And so, forth. so it seemed to me that my argument was still correct as a description of the equilibrium, as it were, but it might be wrong as a description of the process that got you to that. Point. So that's the first point I wanted to make because uh, I felt grateful to Jim for having pointed out that I had not thought through an important part of my argument and I wanted to describe that. Uh, second thing I wanted to discuss, and this is in particular for the economists in the audience, is a more careful analysis 
of my original argument for the efficiency of the uh, legal rules that will be produced. Because going back a step, if somebody asks me, why are you an anarchist? Why do you not want government? A large part of my answer is that we have no political mechanism yet discovered that actually produces good law. All right. Of course, the producers of law, like producers of all products, engage in advertising. And they tell us that they are interested in the common interest and so forth. But we then observe what happens. So that, again, for the economists in the audience will know that the economics of foreign trade was satisfactorily analyzed by an economist called David Ricardo about 200 years ago. Uh, his analysis is what economists still believe in, although the rest of the world mostly hasn't discovered it yet. And one implication of that is that if you put on trade restrictions, tariffs, almost always you are shooting yourself in the foot. That there are some special cases where that isn't true. That as a general rule, if a country puts up trade barriers, it makes its own citizens worse off. I'm not going to try to convince the non-economists that, that would be another talk, but that is has been the consensus view for about 200 years now. For about 200 years, the number of countries that have followed the logic of that, I can count on the fingers of one hand. Maybe I can count on one hand. England in the 19th century had free trade. Hong Kong, which wasn't a country in the 20th century. I may have left someone out, but that's about it. So we have observed a very consistent pattern across a wide variety of different governments that they act in a way that the relevant experts can tell them hurts their own citizens. And again, if I was giving a different talk, I would explain why. But we know, I think, enough about the economics of politics, about what determines the actual outcome of the political market, to realize that that market does not have any strong tendency to create good. So if I have a system that does, that's obviously a big advantage. So I started thinking of the limitations of my argument. And one of the limitations involves what economists call market failure. And market failure, like many terms, does not mean what it sounds like. Market failure is a form of failure, but it has nothing in particular to do with markets. It exists in markets and many other contexts. Market failure is a situation where rational behavior by individuals does not lead to rational behavior. All right. My standard example of market failure is to go back a thousand years and imagine you're one of 5,000 men in a line with spears pointed that direction. And the reason they're pointed that direction is that coming at you are a similar number of men on horseback and they have spears too. And you do a very, very quick cost-benefit analysis. And you say, if all of us stand and keep our spears pointed, if we're lucky, we'll stop their charge and we'll win. Some of us will die, but most of us will win. If we run, horses run faster than we do, so I should stand. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I said we. I don't control him and him. If they stand and I run, there are 5,000 people. My running will have very little effect, and I won't be one of the ones killed. If they run and I stand, that's it. So whatever they do, I'm better off running. We all run, and most of us die. Welcome to the dark side of rationality. All right. That's market failure. That's a case where if each person correctly acts in his own interest, they're all worse off. So I asked, is there market failure on my market? And the answer is yes. Uh, one place where there will be market failure. Imagine we are making a legal rule between me and him, which also affects you. And my standard example is copyright law. Our agencies are deciding whether or not he will have to recognize my copyright whether he can make copies of my books without my permission. And if you think about the economics, the one cost of that is he'll have to pay me some money. But that's all right. One benefit is that I get the money. That, that's a wash between us. That doesn't that mean anything. There's a, there are some further costs that we'll have to spend time and effort watching him to see if he's copying my books. And furthermore, there is what's referred to as the deadweight burden of copyright law, which is the, since the my royalty fee pushes up the price of the book, there might be somebody who, for some odd reason, does not value the book at as much as it costs, therefore doesn't get it, even though his copying the book would cost me nothing, because uh, it costs me nothing how many copies you make, as long as, as, as some of them get paid for. Huh? Uh, so, it might be that the benefit, is there a benefit to balance it? The benefit to the balance it is I'm more likely to write books if I get paid for. All right? So you say it might be the case, and economists don't really know if we should have copyright law, but it might be the case that the benefit of getting more intellectual property produced 
more than balances the costs associated with enforcing intellectual property. But when my agency is bargaining with his agency, they don't take into account benefits to you. And some of the benefit from my writing more books, indeed most of the benefit from my writing more books, goes to people other than the two of us. Because most people are not customers of either my agency or his agency. So we have what economists call an externality. That if his agency agrees to recognize my copyrights, that imposes costs and benefits on us and benefits on the rest of the world. In particular, agencies that don't recognize my copyright get even more benefit because they can make copies of my book for free and I'll write the book because he's paying me to. All right? So that implies, as the economists will see, that my market for law will produce a less than optimal level of protection for intellectual property. All right? It might produce some, it might produce none, I don't know what the optimal level is. But since my original argument is that the legal system produces economically efficient outcomes, I have now shown a respect in which it might fail to do so, in which there might be a change in the law in which everybody agrees to recognize copyright that would produce net benefits but would not happen. All right? So that's the next step. And then I thought a bit more about the economics of this system. And one thing that occurred to me is that there are proofs in economics that a competitive market will produce efficient outcomes. And again, since a few of you are probably not economists, I will not go into details, but the economists are familiar with various efficiency theorems, as they're called. But what I have in my market for law is not really that kind of a market. It, at first, you are tempted to say, look, this is a very efficient market, because what the market is really a market for is legal agreement among people. It's really a market for legal assent, by which he and I, through the middlemen of our agencies, agree on the law between us. And we say, well, there are hundreds of millions of people. I think of this in America. It would be a somewhat smaller number in, in the Czech Republic. So that looks like a very competitive market. No, but it isn't. Because if he doesn't sell me grain, I can buy two units of grain from him. But if he doesn't sell me agreement to a legal rule with us, it does no good to buy two agreements from him. So what we really have in the market for legal assent is not uh, a single competitive market, but about 10 to the 17th power bilateral monopolies. All right, A bilateral monopoly, again, for the non-economists, is a situation there's one buyer and one seller. I am the only person who wants to buy his agreement to legal rules between him and me. He's the only person who can sell it. And therefore, every pair of people represents a, a one more bilateral monopoly between whom we've got to get this agreement. Now, it'll be done through middlemen, of course. You aren't really going to have one with 17 zeros after it bargains going on. But in terms of the logic of the problem, that's, that's what you get. And so, therefore, my efficiency, again, for the economists, really owes more to Coase than to Marshall. It is really the efficiency that we expect to come out of people bargaining to an outcome in their mutual agreement rather than the efficiency that comes when, if I can't buy one unit from you, I can buy two units from you. So that's a further, a further point related to the basic logic of that. Now, there are some other technical points, but I think I want to go on to talk about other things uh, that are associated with, uh, with trying to do ordinary economics for this very odd market in which we produce the rules, which I imagine. Uh, so let me go on to the third part. And this is one where I guess I think things have improved since I wrote the book in two different senses. Both the world has gotten better and my theories have gotten better. Uh, and this is what I described in the original book as the hard problem. And the hard problem is national defense. And what I mean by national defense is defense against other nations. So if I set up, if I can persuade people somehow that in what used to be the United States or what used to be the Czech Republic, we will instead have an anarcho-capitalist society where there is no government, legal rules are bargained by private firms representing customers. How do we prevent Mexico or Canada or somebody else from invading us and taking us over? And the reason this is a problem, again, goes back to market failure because it is an example of what economists call the public good problem. Public good, again, is one of these words that doesn't mean what it sounds like. A public good does not mean something produced by the government. Uh, my government and your government produce lots of private goods, and many public goods are produced privately. Indeed, I would like to believe that at this very instant I am producing a public good. 
Because if, after all, the effect of this talk is to get people to think about the possibility of a much freer society than we have had, and if the result of that is that in a generation or two the world is a freer place, I will have no control over who gets that benefit. A public good for the non-economists is a good such that if it is produced, the producer cannot control who gets it. It's not a full definition, but it's enough of a definition for my purposes. The normal way we produce goods on the free market is that I say to you, I've built a car, if you want that car, you have to pay me for it. And if customers value goods at more than it costs producers to produce them, it will pay a producer to produce something, so those things worth producing get produced. That's, again, a different statement of the economic idea of efficiency. Anything where the benefits of doing it are larger than the cost happens, so cars that are worth more to the customer than, than they cost to the producer get produced, cars that are worth less stuff. Public good, you can't handle that way, because if I can't control who gets something, I can't say to the customer, if you don't pay, you don't get it. So if you imagine a radio broadcast as a standard example of a public good, I produce a radio program, I put it on the air, I can't control who listens to it. So therefore, I can't say to the customers, if you won't pay me for the broadcast, you won't get it. Either I produce it or I don't produce it, but if I produce it, everybody within range gets it. So therefore, it's obviously impossible for radio broadcasts to be privately produced, and only the government produce radio broadcasts. This does not seem to fit the real world. All right? And the reason this particular public good is privately produced is that some unknown genius thought up this wonderful idea of producing not one public good, but two. One public good we call a radio program, and it has a positive cost to produce and a positive value to the customers. The other we call an advertisement, and it has a negative cost to produce because firms will pay the broadcaster to put on their ads, and perhaps a negative value to the customers. So you produce the two public goods and you tie them tightly together, and you give away the package. And that's the private way in which that particular public good is produced. So public goods are a problem for private markets, because the normal sort of conventional standard way of producing goods doesn't work. You can't just say, uh, if it's worth producing, people will pay to produce it. But there are often less direct ways in which you can find some way of getting enough money for producing your public goods so it gets produced. All right? Uh, this particular public good I'm producing, as it happens, I'm doing it for free, as far as I know. If people want to give me money, they're welcome to. But there's no such requirement. I was going to be in Prague anyway. It happens, I enjoy talking. Uh, it also happens I enjoy spreading ideas, and maybe if we have a freer society, maybe I or my children will live in that society too. So I get enough benefit to be willing to give speeches, even though they, I can't control the downstream benefits that if I am lucky, I hope I will, will produce. But think about national defense now. If we defend the United States of America against some enemy, not only the people who pay for the defense get defended, the people who don't pay get defended too. So public, so, so national defense is in that sense a public good. And then the problem is how do you pay for it? And when I originally wrote The Machinery of Freedom, I thought this was a very serious problem for, for where I was living, which was America. Because at that time, the Soviet Union was still a going concern. And they had a great many tanks and a great many hydrogen bombs and a lot of missiles and bombers. And it therefore seemed likely that you would have to spend a good deal of money in order to have enough of a military to persuade them not to conquer you. Now, in that respect, things have improved. Uh, the biggest recent war the United States has been in was the Iraq War. And when the Iraq War got started, I did some arithmetic. I calculated the relative power of the two sides. I added up the GNP of the United States and its allies and the GNP of Iraq and its allies, which didn't have any. And it turned out that the odds in that particular war were about 100 to 1. That's not a war. All right. And it, it killed a lot of people. But it's not a war in the sense in which World War II was a war, or in which the, the war that could have happened in the Cold War. Uh, so the Soviet Union was a serious problem. The Soviet Union no longer exists. It is true that there are various people in Al-Qaeda who would like to kill Americans. But they kill a very small number of Americans compared to what, really, what real wars kill. So in that sense, the problem has gotten much easier since I wrote the book. And it will not take a very large military 
to defend the United States from either Mexico or Canada. And those are the only people who seem to be in a position to invade us, since they're our only neighbors. But nonetheless, it's still a general issue. It might be more of a problem for the Czech Republic, which has other neighbors, or for other countries in, in the future. So the question is, how could you defend a society without a government, without a state? And my idea, my current ideas for this, uh, which go further than the ideas in the book, involve putting together a number of different things I have observed. Uh, one of them is the theory of the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That's the part of the Constitution that says people have the right to bear arms, the right to have guns. Also, a short story by Rudyard Kipling. Also, my observation of the hobbies of a number of people in America, such as people who play paintball. Do you have paintball in the Czech Republic, too? Or an organization I have been involved with, which is called the Society for Creative Anachronism, which does medieval and renaissance things for fun and which has battles in which you have perhaps a thousand or two thousand people on a side fighting with swords and shields, but the swords aren't sharp. The armor is real and the weapons aren't, so it's become a sport rather than a, than a real battle. But people put a lot of time and effort into doing it. Uh, and finally, the last piece of my puzzle, which those of you who are computer people will be familiar with, is the open source movement, which produced Linux and a variety of other kinds of computer software in a fashion that did not involve paying anybody for their time. Right. So let me go back to the first part of it, which is the Second Amendment. Because the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, as I understand it, reflects the solution of that society to a what was in the 18th century seen as a very serious problem. And the problem was that it was clear that professional soldiers were better than amateur soldiers, that professional armies beat amateur armies. It was also clear that professional armies were very dangerous because once you had a professional army, it might decide it wasn't getting paid enough and take over. And as you may know, in the 17th century, England had a civil war. In fact, England had two civil wars. In the first civil war, the parliament and various other parts of England fought against the king and the nobility in various parts of England, and they defeated them. They defeated them with a professional army that was commanded by a very able general by the name of Oliver Cromwell. The Second Civil War consisted of Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army against everybody else, and he won. And the result was a military dictatorship for about 14 years until Cromwell died. Uh, he was a, quite a good military dictator. I don't want to suggest that he didn't do a better job than the king would have done. But nonetheless, it was a military dictator. And that suggested a problem. How do you defend your country without creating an army that can take over your country? And I think the solution the founders of my country came to is you have a very small professional army and a very large militia. So the idea of their system was the reason that everybody has the right to bear arms is because that way every adult man in the society is available to be a volunteer in a very large, not very high quality army. You then have a small professional army. And if you get into a war with somebody, the professional army sort of organizes things and the low quality but very large army is available to fight. And if the professional army tries to take over the government, they are outgunned a thousand to one. And I think that was the basic theory. I'm not sure it's a good theory now because uh, the advantage of the professionals over amateurs are larger now than they were in the 18th century because we have more advanced military technology. But it was a clever idea then. So part of my idea is that you defend your free society with the combination of a large, not very good militia and a small professional army. And the professional army can be paid by charity, that after all, charity is one way we produce public goods in the world as we know it, uh, that when people say something is a good cause, some of them are willing to give money for it, and maybe not as much as it's worth, but something, and that might be enough to get some tens of thousands of professional soldiers in a country with hundreds of millions of people paid enough to do it. And then where do you get your militia? Well, I was mentioning paintball. There are a lot of people who find uh, military exercises, as long as you don't get killed, to be an exciting uh, kind of sport. And uh, they do paintball, they fight with swords and shields, they play board games, they do things online, they play at war. 
In addition, in a society that is functioning well, people like their society. So there is a feeling that the willingness to defend your society makes you a good person. And so I am imagining a future society without government where there are a whole lot of volunteers who don't expect to ever have a bullet shot at them, but are willing to put in the time and effort so that if they do have to fight, they have some idea of how to do it. Uh, and they do that partly for fun and partly to be seen as good you know, public-spirited citizens by their neighbors, as it were. And probably some of the cost of doing this is funded by firms because every April 15th, that you're not American, so April 15th may have no resonance for you, but that's the day we pay our taxes. Every April 15th, when we have the parade to celebrate the end of government, the Apple computer company has a little company in the parade flying their banner in order to testify that they are willing to give their employees time off to train to be part of the volunteer force that will defend the society. And Microsoft has a, if Microsoft is still around there, which it may or may not be, has a group with its banner. And so does Ford Motor and so do other people. So that I would imagine that in this society, uh, being seen to contribute to the costs of maintaining a whole lot of volunteers is good advertising, good public relations for, for a company. Being seen to be one of those volunteers, just as in America today, if you are a veteran, or a member of the armed forces, people tend to treat you better. Uh, I noticed that when I fly on the airplane, in most airlines in America, with one important exception, you have to pay for checked luggage. Unless you're a member of the military, then they give it to you for free. And that's a part of a general social attitude. It's a little hard to fit in into economics, but that people sort of appreciate other people doing things for them. As well. So I think you could put those things together. Finally, I wanted to give a little bit of credit to Rudyard Kipling, because he's one of my favorite authors, both as a prose author and as a poet. He even wrote one anarchist poem, I should mention. Uh, and, but he has a story. The story is called The Army of a Dream. And the narrator, who is presumably Kipling, has apparently come back to England after a long time. And he's talking with a friend of his who's a military officer. And he has discovered that something has changed. That in England that he has come back to, the universal sport is no longer football or cricket. It's now military exercises. It's done as games. Teams of people doing fake battles with referees deciding who would have won. And you don't have to do it. But if you don't do it, the girls probably won't date you because you're a wimp. And it's sort of this, the thing to do kind of thing. And there are some professional soldiers, and they're the referees, and they help organize it. And the result is that England, at a moment's notice, can field 10 million people, trained and armed. And the rest of the world is very careful not to go into war with England. And that's the basis of the story, except that at the very end of the story, uh, Kipling notices that the friend he's talking to has a bullet hole in the middle of his forehead and remembers that he died in the Boer War and realizes this is all a dream. <laughs> it's quite a good story. It's, you can find it on the web if you want to read it, The, the Army of the Dream. So it occurred to me that that was also a part of what was going into my idea of how a free society might defend itself. And then, as I mentioned, open source software, which is the production of high-quality computer software. Linux is, I suppose, the third most important operating system at the moment in the world. And it's done by volunteers. And they're doing it in part for status. They're doing it because they want to have their name on a piece of software that many people use, and they want to be a part of that. It's, that's not a full account of open source software. So anyway, so those are the things which I added. If we had more time, there were more things I could talk about. But uh, I discovered long ago that the nice thing about a question period is that when you're answering a question, you know there's at least one other person in the room interested in what you're talking about. <laughs> so at this point, I will end. Uh, at some point, this third edition will happen, but not in the immediate future. Uh, and these are some of the things that we'll go into. Thank you. Thank you very much. starting a discussion. So we will have about 30 minute discussion. Um, so let me mention that this event was organized by Liberani Institute but was co-organized by several institutes. There is in the neighborhood and they really cooperate uh, very efficiently with inviting people and 
so I suppose that some some of you here are on the list of the several institute. So let's any notes, remarks, answers, questions. <laughs> I guess I'll start. Okay. I was just wondering, um, is there any change in the way that these ideas are received when you talk publicly about them? Since it's like a good question. Forty years. Forty years. Since what, what do you see? Yeah. So it was, it was published. Yeah. Um, do people still look at you as a crazy? You have free eyes. Or crazy ideas. Yeah. yeah. I think less so. I think less so. Oh, I think part of the difference m may be the internet. That there's one effect of the internet is that small intellectual groups have find it easier to talk to each other. Uh, as you may know, there is an organization called the Montpelierin Society, which mm -hmm. some Czechs are members of, and I'm a member of, which was formed after World War II. And the reason it was an organization of classical liberals, most of them less extreme than I am. And part of the reason it was formed was that each of those classical liberals was surrounded by people who knew he was wrong, who knew that socialism was the answer, basically, because that was the leading intellectual view in 1946-47. And it was nice once in a while to get together with other people who didn't think you were crazy. And uh, quite a while ago, some members of the society suggested that it ought to shut down, that at this point those ideas were sufficiently widespread it wasn't needed. And it was pointed out that they might be sufficiently widespread in the United States and in England and perhaps in some other places, that, but that in India and in China uh, and in many parts of the Third World, at that time, people still thought that socialism was the answer. And that, therefore, the society still played a very important role for people from that part of the world. Nowadays, the Internet provides for many more people a substitute. So Now, that's good and bad. On the one hand, it means that if you've got really nutty ideas, you can find 40 other nuts, talk only to each other, and never realize the ideas are nutty. But it also means that if you have defensible ideas, you can find other people to discuss them seriously. And it means that people who don't know what the answer is have the option of finding something where somebody's arguing for something that their neighbors don't believe in and, and learning about it. So that, for example, at this point, I... I forgot I was going to actually record this talk, and I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but often when I give talks, I record them. And I put those recorded talks up on my web page. My web page, for anybody who wants to look at it, is www.daviddfriedman.com. F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, because there are several different spellings of that name. And you have to have the D in the middle. If I applied for my web page about five months earlier, I could have done without the D. But mm -hmm. another David Friedman beat me to it. Uh, so I have recordings of many of my talks, and the result is that many people can listen to those talks and see if they find them convincing, or if they find them convincing, arguing them with their friends. So my impression is that there is more openness to those sorts of ideas than there was even 10 or 15 years ago. But it's very hard to tell, because each of us sees only a small subset of the world. And I must say I was pleasantly surprised by how successful Ron Paul was in the... Uh, presidential nominating procedure this time. Because Ron Paul, I don't, he probably isn't an anarchist, but he certainly is pretty far out on the libertarian spectrum. Uh, and I should say that one thing I found a little surprising, as you may know, the big political fight in the United States at the moment is over Obamacare, over the mandate. Nobody seems to have noticed that the legal theorist who is chiefly responsible for the challenges to that is somebody whose views are almost as nutty as mine are. I won't name any name, but he's a friend of mine, and I know roughly what his views are. Uh, so in that sense, I think that one can come closer to making these arguments being taken seriously than one wants to be. And I think that's also true in the, in the, in the academic world, that I think there are a fair number of economists uh, who don't necessarily agree with the anarchist position, but see it as one, one part of the range of interesting views you ought to think about. Uh, that I'm pretty sure I spent uh, fall quarter at George Mason University in Virginia uh, visiting. And the reason I was there is that there are a group of what I think of as younger economists, they're younger than me, they may not be younger than you, who are interesting people. They're smart people. And one of them I first encountered when he published an article in the Journal of Economics and Philosophy attacking me. But it was an attack which took me seriously. He was arguing that there were certain reasons why my system wouldn't work. 
I published a rebuttal. I gather other people. I, I believe, as a general rule, in the policy of fire and forget. I think it is a mistake to write one article and spend the rest of your life defending it. So in that case, I wrote a book. Much, much later, Tyler Cohen, who's the person I'm thinking of, wrote an article arguing that part of my argument was wrong. I wrote a response and I went away. I gather other people continue the argument, so, so it didn't die. So in that sense, I think there are many more of the sort of smarter, more interesting people who see the, who are libertarians mostly, in some sense, not necessarily as extreme as I am, and who see the argument for doing away with government entirely as an interesting argument. Similarly, one of the things I've done since then is to study a wide variety of historical legal systems. Mm -hmm. And I have an article which I turned into a chapter in the second edition of Machinery of Freedom about the legal system of saga period Iceland. And it was not a full anarcho capital system because they had a legislature and they had a court system. But they had no enforcement arm. All enforcement was private. And since then I have learned more of feud systems. And at least in America, feud is thought of as a dirty word. Because they imagine that a feud system means I kill you, then you kill me, then my relatives kill you. That's not how real feud systems work. Real feud systems are systems where what enforces the law is victims' willingness to use force in their own defense, but where there are mechanisms such that if you try to use force aggressively, you will usually lose. And there turns out there are a wide variety of historical feud systems. And in fact, I have concluded that two of the great religious laws of the world, Jewish law and Islamic law, are both built on the remnants of feud systems. And that would be another talk I gave in Jerusalem part of a talk here in Jerusalem a week or so ago, which is why I'm on this side of the Atlantic. Because somebody else was willing to pay me to, well, I'm willing to pay me, willing to pay my, <laughs> my expenses to come, and that was a sufficient reason, and my wife's expenses. So, so I guess you could say they paid me in that sense. Anyway, uh, but, but that you can see in both Jewish law and Sharia, the, what's left of what was once a system in which the basic mechanism for enforcing law was people using force in their own defense with ways of regularizing and really the system that I invented from a whole cloth is a more elaborate version of a feud system in that it's firms, not individuals, but ultimately it's a decentralized use of force to enforce legal rules and a mechanism, decentralized mechanism for generating legal rules as opposed to... And of course, if you think about it, there is a certain sense in which all of us live in such a system because in addition to laws, we have norms. We have rules of social behavior. So that I like to tell my students, there is no law that prevents me from teaching a class naked to the waist. All right? Nonetheless, it would be foolish of me to do so. Because there would be costs in my doing so. I would get the reputation of being even crazier than I am. <laughs> uh, and there are many, many other ways. There's a book actually by a Yale law professor, Robert Ellickson, who also I think is a libertarian, though a little less extreme than I am, called Order Without Law. And it's largely about the system of norms about two hours from where I live in California, in a rural county, Shasta County in California, where for certain legal issues, the law of the state of California does not run. Because there are norms of neighborly behavior enforced by decentralized mechanisms. And one of the norms of neighborly behavior is that neighbors do not sue neighbors. And therefore, if your neighbor does things that under the law of California you could sue him for, you'll lose more than you'll gain by suing him. And therefore, the real order in that system is by a decentralized mechanism where if you violate the norms in ways that hurt me, eventually I do things that hurt you. And that, that describes a lot of how the world works already. And in a sense, what I'm doing is just expanding that kind of system to cover it. So that's too long an answer, but hopefully it answers it. Other people? Thank you. Libor so, uh, so you, uh, you were worried that you know, the, uh, the kind of the private production of the legal system may not produce the first best legal system to have a policy. We have surrounded some areas yes. and I'll issue on the list. Sure. I would rather say that by the, from, you know, the legal rules, that's a, the legal system is a very sophisticated product that at the end is being supplied by, by experts. So these kind of markets, they always have the uh, asymmetric information you know, issue that you as a customer don't really know what is the right for you and rely on experts, wasn't there an um, inherent incentives on the part of the providers to provide something that's something yes. more sophisticated, more expensive, because you see kind of judge. Likewise, say in the product protection market, you are worried about all the police 
So what I'm going to say is this is the more complicated one there is a you know, small number of firms. But there's a really you know, perverse incentive problems in the sense that these firms you actually create their own demand by you know, selling you know, some plugs uh, to attack people mm -hmm. exactly just to increase the demand for their but services. Which of course, then I, I, I remember the seven year of time, it would turn out that they're doing this, or you know, they could build up a reputation of not doing this, but they're doing this kind of a, you know, at least a short term mm -hmm. of protein mode yeah. is there. So it's a certain fraction of firms, a certain fraction of time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is certainly true that, that one cannot rely on the market to always give you the first best. But then the competition is not very strong because you cannot rely on the alternative to even give you the second or third best. That if you, I understand. But, but what I was going to say is if, 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 you think about, if you think about how well informed the customer is in choosing an enforcement agency compared to how well informed the voter is in choosing a government. Because that's really the relevant comparison. And there are two different ways in which the voter is in a much weaker position. To begin with, the voter has no incentive to be well informed. Because except in a very small society, the voter knows that his vote has essentially zero chance of changing the outcome. So therefore, voters are rationally ignorant. And even if the voter could figure out that one of the candidates was going to do a better job than the other, it wouldn't be worth doing so. All right. On the other hand, if I can figure out that enforcement agency A produces better protection at a lower cost than enforcement agency B, I become a customer of A, I get all the benefit. So therefore, to begin with, the voter is rationally ignorant, the consumer is not. Second, the information costs, although I agree that information is costly, you'll never have <coughs> information, but the information costs to the consumer on my market are much lower than the voter on the political market, because they can observe the alternatives. That we will never get to see how the Obama administration of the last few years compares with the McCain administration of those few years. We only get one candidate. So therefore, even if I say, look, things went terribly badly under Obama, the unemployment rate stayed up, deficit skyrocketed, somebody could not unreasonably say, yes, but it would have been even worse under McCain. It might even be true. Obama would certainly say that. Uh, or his supporters would say that. On the other hand, if I, uh, if somebody tells me all computers are clumsy and hard to learn, I say, no, no, I've got this Macintosh. I like it very much. That demonstrates that one can do better computers. Uh, so in general, in the market context, information is not free, but both the information is more readily available because you can observe the outcome. My neighbor has one agency, different for someone else has another, and because I have an incentive to actually try to figure out who is providing the better service. So I think, I certainly agree that, that you won't get first best. Uh, and I was discussing what seemed to me an interesting reason why you wouldn't. I could have given some other reasons. For, again, for the economists in the audience, this is a monopolistic competition, not a true perfect competition. In monopolistic competition, you only care about marginal consumers. So Apple could change their computers in a way that made them worse for me, but not for marginal customers. And it would cost them nothing. I'd still buy a Mac because I like it much better than I like Windows. And similarly, the rights enforcement agencies have to worry about the marginal customers. So there are a variety of other ways I could have discussed for the economists in which this is not perfectly efficient. All I am claiming is that we have much better reason to expect good law from this than we have to expect good law from conventional political institutions. Uh, somebody over there? Uh, my name is Asante Kassi, and I'm from the University of Netherlands as well. I have uh, actually uh, an opposite problem with the argument that the gentleman uh, before me had uh, discussed. It seems to me that we consider the uh, society uh, as a uh, big mass of actually passive people. So uh, everybody delegates their uh, protection to some enforcement. Uh, Yes. Uh, but uh, in the uh, uh, systems you refer to, such as uh, ancient Iceland or third systems, uh, people actually mostly protected themselves. They were not uh, passive customers and they uh, had arms, and if somebody stuck to them, they would just shoot or stuff. Neighbors. 
So in this system, uh, it seems to me, uh, it would be uh, less likely that uh, big companies would uh, monopolize the market because there will be a uh, 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 response from, uh, like, grassroots response again. People will protect themselves. Yes, but it might be, it might work better than mm -hmm. there, but to begin with, of course, in the Icelandic case, you really have coalitions uh, which, which, which will enforce this. Uh, feuds are not usually done by a single person. But, uh, but to me, it seems to me that the, that, the, that the fundamental difference is the same as the difference between a primitive society where people produce everything for themselves and a market society where you have a high level of division of labor and therefore each person does a little bit and gets everything else from other people. Uh, so, so I guess I think, I actually sometimes in trying to explain my system, I sometimes sketch out what the primitive version would look like. If I imagine it, really, that's really intended for people who think this is logically impossible. And I imagine a society with a fairly thin population, where people know each other, uh, where if I go around beating up people and claiming they stole things from me when they didn't, it'll be obvious to my neighbors and they won't support me and so forth. But, 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 it seems, but, but I'm not sure why in my system the question is not will people resist uh, thugs or whatever. It is will there be a firm which will sell me the service of protecting me against thugs just as there is a firm. I can't make this and yet I've got it uh, through a division of labor. So I, uh, I'm not sure might be a more, you, you get better sagas in the Icelandic case, you get better stories out of that version because it's closer to individuals who are heroes or cowards or whatever. But I'm not sure I see why I would expect rights protection to work better when each person does it for himself than when we can subcontract it to other people, as long as the economies of scale are not too large. Because if the economies of scale go too far, then we have a real problem because there's nobody to protect me from my protector. But of course, that's my present situation. There, on April 15th, there is nobody to protect me from my protector. And they will send me, they send me a bill and I pay that bill. Uh, yeah. uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, people should, defend, uh, should yes. only defend themselves and shouldn't be against. Yes. I would say that uh, they are not, uh, like in the event of monopolization, they shouldn't be necessarily uh, passive uh, observers. Yes. It, I agree. And one possible way of preventing the monopoly would be a culture where you got a revolt when that happened. That's a possibility. But I prefer. I would prefer to sort of rely on arguments that, are, that, I, that I see as solider, as it were, than that one. You know, it's, it, it is possible. Uh, it, we don't really understand anything like everything about human societies. I should say, by the way, for anybody who might, might want to go to my webpage, that my current project is a book called Legal Systems Very Different from Ours, which includes not only Iceland, but Periclean Athens, uh, Imperial China, Cheyenne Indians, a whole bunch of systems. And the basic idea is that all human societies face about the same problems. They solve them in an interesting range of different ways. It's not obvious that we are any smarter than people at other times and places, and therefore it's interesting to take all of those solutions seriously, to try to say, how did their legal system work? Why did it work this way? What can we learn from it? So if you're curious, go off of my webpage and you will find a link to the draft of that. Now, I should say, I just got an email today from somebody who tells me that a couple of the chapters, the links to the chapters, are broken. So if you can't get to the chapter, wait a few days, and when I get home, I will fix them. Uh, Romanio. Yes. I have two questions and one short story, which perhaps I need to. But first, I will ask you, are you still, I suppose, such a great admirer of G.K. Chesterton? Yes, I am, I am still an admirer. I, he was crazy, but he was he was one of our crazy people. <laughs> I exactly know what you yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the story which I mean to you was a discussion some fifteen years ago during the um, one Czech parliamentarian and one British diplomat, a young man, stationed here in Prague in the university, and they had some discussion and the Czech parliamentarian just mentioned G. K. Chester. And uh, the, par uh, the the British diplomat was completely ignored about the man and that was very cool. And the Czech parliamentarian at that time
Uh, is what? Yes, correct. That was not an option in the 18th century. As, as I was saying, I thought the second, it seemed to me the Second Amendment was a clever solution for the situation that then existed. I don't think it is adequate. No, no I don't think it's adequate for but But I could use some of its ideas uh, for it. No, I would assume that if there are nations with nuclear weapons, that one of the things my charity is going to be supporting, or perhaps some firm will generously provide, will be devices for that. And in fact, I have a short story I'm not going to write in my head. And the story goes as follows. This is set in, this, in my imaginary society. And there is something like the Soviet Union. And they launch an attack. And all of the missiles explode on launch. And two people are discussing why did this happen. And one of them says, well, I'm not certain, but do you remember last year when the team from Apple Computer Company won the target shooting competition, even though they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn, because they hacked into the scoring computers and gave themselves all perfect scores? I think they did it again. <laughs> and of course, this is in a sense, becoming more real, as you may know, because as far as we can tell, the Israelis have been fighting the Iranians by writing software, basically. And with how much success, we don't know. We probably will never know, but some success. But anyway, but yes, no, no, I agree. And one of, the, this is a problem I raised, I had a long, long time ago, an argument with my friend Jeff Hummel, who, who thought that national defense was less of a problem than I thought it was. And, you know, sort of, the version I gave is the enemy say we will drop an atomic bomb on your city unless you pay us a hundred million dollars. We'll leave it to you to raise the money. And the first city turns them down so they bomb it. So you clearly do need against nuclear weapons, you need some equivalent kind of mechanism. What that mechanism would be, I do, I, I do not know. Uh, Any more questions? So yeah. So, sort of a semi-practical question. Yes. As practical as we can get in this uh, uh, topic is, so imagine you're a benevolent dictator who kind of is given the goal of actually moving to the United States towards the private production of nuclear weapons. Let's talk about this kind of like, controversial part of these three, you know, yeah. topics that we discussed. Now, she cannot really, you know, shatter the system overnight and replace it with the absolutely world order. So, what would be kind of the first practical steps, you know, that would be able to doable in a relatively short time, so it would within the current framework, it would kind of move us reasonably close yeah. towards that. But I don't think there's a particular first. I think the answer is, I agree, I am not a revolutionary. My impression is that revolutions usually make things worse, because in the world as it now is, people think of government as sort of the protector of safety. And when people are getting killed, that means they will have even more government. And that means, that, indeed, going back to the Second Amendment for the moment, the reason I am in favor of the Second Amendment at present is not for the original reason. The reason is that if the populace is disarmed, then the only protection against murderers and rapists and, and robbers is the police. And if the only protection against those things are the police, you are willing to tolerate the police doing a lot of bad things. Whereas if you have a society where you say, well, most of the time, the reason people don't murder somebody is the guy will kill them if they will shoot them if they bat. That most of the time, the reason you don't mug somebody is you're afraid he's carrying a gun. Some people are, some aren't. The police only come in once in a while. Now you're more willing to say, and when the police kill an innocent person, lock them up too. You're more willing to enforce, as we don't, unfortunately, the ordinary rules against the law enforcers as well as against everybody else. So that's my view of the reason why I want to keep the right to bear arms is not to solve the 18th century problem, but to solve the 21st century. Century problem. Uh, I've got other views on how you, on, on, on ways you solve some of the 18th century problems. That would be a, be a different a different talk. Uh, but what? Yes, I'm sorry. I got I got off. Go back and push me back in the right direction. 
Oh, but yes, right, 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 right. Yeah, no, but the, the answer is that you would, in very, some of it's already happened. FedEx and, and UPS are part of the solution. All right, Federal Express, you people, you, some of you are young. There was a time when it was taken for granted that if there wasn't a U.S. post office, the mail wouldn't get delivered. And the fact that there are now two major and some minor firms which do almost the equivalent of the post office and would do all of it if they were allowed to because there are legal restrictions on competing with the post office means that people are less afraid to reduce the power of government. Similarly, uh, if schooling became much more private, and that's happening at the moment in two different ways. One of them is homeschooling, which is what we did for our children for at least the last six years or so of their education. Uh, and the other is voucher systems in which the government is still paying for it but no longer running it. If we had a U.S. in which uh, most children were privately schooled, even if the government was paying for it even more if it wasn't, it would be easier for people to say, well, you know, if we get rid of a bit more government, that's not scary. Similarly, uh, to the extent that protection against crime is private. It's been true for a long time that the total number of private people in the industry of protecting against crime is larger than the number of public people. People who install burglar alarms, private guard companies, a bunch of things of that sort. If you think about the kind of uh, housing development where you've got a guard at the door and where it's really doing most of the work uh, itself, that would again be uh, a way. So I think in general, what, what I see as the way to do it is to just, in one place after another, uh, not have a revolution, but just replace government with other things. And let me mention two science fiction stories, which are in a way, different ways relevant to this. One of them is Snow Crash, which is a rather tongue-in-cheek future science fiction story set in an anarcho-capitalist world where the government still exists, but nobody pays any attention to it. Uh, and the other is a book called Oath of Fealty by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. Niven is probably one of the best idea people in modern science fiction. And that, in a way, cuts the other way, because that's describing a single building the size of a small city, privately owned, built in Los Angeles in this fictional future where there had been a riot that destroyed a lot of the city, and where the building has, in effect, subcontracted all of the government roles. Uh, not entirely imaginary. If you think, for example, of the Jewish communities in Europe in the Middle Ages, they subcontracted a large part of the government role. One of the things I realized when I was studying law is that for almost 2,000 years after the destruction of the Kingdom of Israel, most Jews were living under Jewish law because the Gentile rulers found that the easiest way of dealing with their Jewish subjects was to subcontract the job of taxing them and ruling them to the local Jewish authorities. So, but in the fictional one, the interesting thing is that you realize by the end of the book that because this private organization is providing the functions of government, it has also become the focus of the emotions associated with government, which is why the title is Oath of Fielding that the people who live in this think of the private organization as what they are loyal to, just as. And that could be dangerous, because then that might let it get away with it. I won't summarize the plot, but it's an interesting, it's an ingenious and thoughtful and thoughtful plot. Okay, yeah. so let me finish with <coughs> quoting David Friedman. One reason for writing a book like this, means Machinery of Freedom, is to avoid having to explain the same set of ideas a hundred times to a hundred different people. <laughs> so I think that it, it's a real, it's a real end of our discussion and perhaps also attraction to buy this book. But it is also available on the internet because if I can find it, so I could find it on you could find it for free on the website. Internet. And exactly. The, the history of that is that somebody pirated the book. Somebody created an unauthorized online version, and I told my publisher. And my publisher did something and it vanished. And a little while later it reappeared. I don't mind people publishing the book, people pirating the book. I want people to read the book. But my publisher has the right to enforce copyright law if they want to. But I didn't think it was my job to be their detective, so I ignored it. But I did download a copy of the pirated version. <laughs> and 
after a while, I persuaded my publisher to give me permission to web the book. So did I bother to scan in the book? No, I took the pirated copy and put it up on my web page. So that's what you can read. I pirated the pirate. <laughs> um, so let me invite you for reception so we have on the third floor. So all of you are invited and you can just continue with private discussion with David D. Friedman. And do you know what D, as this initial letter means? It means... Director, David Director Friedman, and it's according to his uncle, famous economist Aaron Director. More precisely, it's according to my mother, whose <laughs> brother Aaron was. My mother's maiden name is Director. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you thank very you. much indeed.